Two people die in the ER of a Montreal area hospital. Canada's banks are still making stupid high profits. A spike in sexual assault has been identified in a survey of Canadian Armed Forces personnel, and Nigeria's army has seemingly bombed a celebration by accident, killing at least 126 civilians. Good morning. It's Wednesday, December 6th. Yes, the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. I'm Nora, coming to you from Vancouver. I'm still here. I'm, I'm actually, I'm stuck here. <laughs> Who knows where I'll be coming to you from tomorrow. Here are your headlines. This morning we start in Montreal, where CTV's Rachel Lau is reporting that two people died while waiting at the emergency room of the Anna La Berge Hospital in Chateau Gay. The regional health centre that oversees the hospital, Le Centre Intégré de Santé et des Services Sociaux de la Montérégie Ouest, said that it isn't commenting on what happened, though they did say that the hospital has been, quote, very busy and wait times are very high, unquote. President of the Association des Spécialistes en Médecine d'Urgence du Québec, Dr. Gilbert Boucher, said that doctors have been finding it impossible to treat patients quickly due to a lack of everything. Nurses, beds and stretchers, for example. He made this comment to CTV, quote, In the emergency, for two to three days to be at 150 and 200 percent, we can survive. We manage. But when it's been two, four, six weeks in Anna Laberge case, it does become dysfunctional. At 200%, there are people everywhere. You basically put patients anywhere they will fit. Computer systems have problems keeping track of those patients. The ratio of nurses per patient explodes, and it becomes to the point where triage nurse is basically the worst job in the hospital because the waiting room is full and nobody gets seen. And then bad things happen to patients, which is really, really unfortunate, unquote. And here's a side note. That was a really sloppy quote. It really needs to be cleaned up, CTV. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Quebec's Minister of Health, Christian Dubé, visited the hospital after the deaths. The day after Dubé's visit, the hospital was again at 200% capacity. Montrealers spend an average of 10 hours, 27 minutes in the ER. That is more than double the average across the province, which is 5 hours, 11 minutes. The article doesn't mention that from December 11th to December 14th, the province's nursing union, La Fédération Interprofessionnelle de la Santé du Québec, will be walking off the job in strike, triggered by the deteriorating conditions of the healthcare system. Next up, Canada's banks reported their third quarter profits, and here is how Pete Evans from the CBC reported that. The Royal Bank, TD, and CIBC all released their quarter three results last week. Now, the thing I love about reporting about banks in Canada is that there is always bad news, despite the fact that the banks are always making very big profits. This year's bad news? that the banks are setting aside a lot of money to cover potential bad loans. Now, I do want to mention that Evans writes this line, quote, while all three remain very profitable, unquote. That seems kind of an insignificant line to say in a story about billions and billions of dollars in profits, but it is not something that would have been written in years past for similar stories. For years, you had to read stories really closely to learn that actually, the banks are still extremely profitable. So anyway, baby steps, I guess. But overall, the report's not that great. So let's talk about those profits, which Evans buries underneath the amounts of money that they're setting aside for bad loans. The Royal Bank made $4.13 billion in quarter three alone. Yeah, $4.13 billion dollars. That was higher than the year previous when they made 3.88 billion. Profit at TD fell from 6.67 billion last year to 2.89 billion. That's still profits, 2.89 billion dollars in profits. That bank raised its payout to shareholders anyway from 96 cents per share to $1.02. And CIBC, their profits were up from last year too at 1.48 billion. Now, TD is also planning to cut 3% of its workforce, eliminating the jobs of just over 3,000 people. 
CIBC, despite its profits, has laid off almost 2,400 people. And Evans reports that Scotiabank and Royal have had, quote, similarly sized layoffs, unquote. I think it's really important to look at how the banks operate with their profits and layoffs, because we're so often told that layoffs are the sad but inevitable consequence of a business not doing very well. But here we have proof that when businesses do unbelievably well, make unbelievable amounts of money, they are still going to lay off workers. When you translate that to workers in the fossil fuel industry where there's more demand for renewables, or if you translate that into the journalism industry where it is hard to make money, of course, the first thing that management always does is cut jobs. Do they have to cut jobs? Rarely do they have to cut jobs, but it's all about the bottom line and it's all about making as much money as possible, not just making enough money to say that you're in the black. Evans relies on this standard template for reporting bank profits and goes right away to an analyst that makes it sound like these institutions are in dire straits. Here is Manulife's Dominique Lapointe. Quote, in the next couple of quarters, we think for the sector in general, it's going to be a tougher economic environment. That doesn't mean that this will lead to any sort of massive changes into the employment picture, but for sure, some difficulties ahead. And if and when interest rates start to be lower, banks will face stronger profits and are going to reduce their provisions for potential losses, unquote. Potential losses, potential losses in a story about billions and billions of profits in an industry that makes tens of billions of dollars annually. Potential losses. Man, that is the funniest thing I have ever heard. Anyway, we will have to wait and see if these banks start showing up at the local food bank. Next to another one of these stories that seems to be told over and over again, Statistics Canada is showing that there has been a notable spike in sexual assaults in the Canadian Armed Forces in 2022. The report from Aaron Dandrea from Global News focuses on a survey called the Survey on Sexual Misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces, undertaken on behalf of the Armed Forces, that found that 3.5% of Armed Forces personnel were sexually assaulted by another military member. That equals 1,960 regular force members. In 2018, that percentage was 1.6%. The number of people who replied this year was also far lower than in 2018 or 2016, from 61% in 2016 down to 33% this year. Still, 18,582 regular force members responded. This spike has happened even though the armed forces have been focusing on sexual assault in the previous few years. Former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour found that the Canadian Armed Forces sexual assault problems poses a liability for Canada. One third of all sexual assaults, say members, were related to drug or alcohol use. Women were more than double more likely than men to say that drugs and alcohol were a factor in the sexual assault. And... Also, remember, remember the justification for why the armed forces were in Ukraine before Russia invaded? One of the arguments was that our military was going to show Ukrainians how to get rid of gender-based violence and sexism. I always think about that when I see data come out about the prevalence of sexual assault in our armed forces. And finally, to Nigeria, the People's Gazette is reporting that the Nigerian army has admitted to accidentally bombing Kaduna villages, killing some 126 civilians. The official number of casualties was not released by the Nigerian army, but an anonymous report from a military official placed the death toll at 126. It's possible that more bodies will be found. Valentin Okoro, a military leader, said that he admitted that drone operators mistook the villagers for bandits. The Nigerian military has been fighting these bandits who, as the People's Gazette says, have been terrorizing the area. The people who were killed had been celebrating the Muslim festival of Molud at 9 p.m. on Sunday. The Nigerian Air Force has never admitted before that they use unmanned drones until this incident. It isn't the first time, though, that civilians have been killed by these drones. More than 100 people were killed by a mistaken drone launch last January. And previously, a wedding party and Nigerian soldiers themselves have been mistaken targets of the army. Those are your headlines for Wednesday, December 6th. 
I'm Nora. You're listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed and anywhere you get your podcasts. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. And hey, think about me. Maybe I got home today. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm still in Vancouver. Who knows? Uh, regardless, I'll talk to you tomorrow.